Well, welcome to the Christ-centred cosmic civilization as we continue to look at language. And we've been thinking about the power of even just simple everyday language and words and how um, words do things, change things, bring about um, genuine reality. So it's not uh, like we, this has become like a truism, like not we this is something that's often pointed out nowadays, but I know thirty or forty years ago it was considered quite a big insight the way that um words do things, so think about simple words that bring about real change that do things so um in a marriage ceremony, will you take this person to be your lawful wedded? husband or wife, so on. And then the answer is, uh, I will. In, well, in America, it's I will. Uh, in in England, we say, I do. Do you do this? And we answer, I do. And then when we say the word I do or I will, uh, that then that that situation become, becomes real. They, you are then married. Or if you say, I resign, when you're in a job, saying those words brings about the, uh, uh, that situation where you have resigned now because you've uttered those words. Or if you say, this means war, then war begins. If you say to someone, I love you, that those words are not merely descriptive of something. They bring about uh, a situation. They bring about a relationship. Or if we say to someone, you are forgiven, uh, and they've asked us for forgiveness, and then we say those words, you are forgiven, um, then they are. That's what the situation is. Or say... Parents might say to a child, we never really wanted you. Those are not merely words to say such a thing to a child. Changes that child in a way forever. That Such words uh, could never be undone. They could never be forgotten. They, they, they have such an impact. If we say to someone, you are ugly and fat. Uh, so, so powerful a vision is that. Particularly if it was said repeatedly, but even just once, uh, brings about change. Or we say, you can do it. To say that to somebody can enable them to do something that they didn't think they could do. Or just simply, we support you. Tremendously powerful words that change reality. You are free. The words like that, you are free, can set somebody free in, in various cultural and historical contexts. You are free. Words can accomplish so much and change our lives so deeply. There are so many examples of this. And we just want to reflect on that, that words then are not uh, like alongside reality, that they create reality, change us, bring about new relationships in so many ways. Um, here's a quotation from a guy called Patrick Rothfuss uh, from his book, The Name of the Wind. And it, it, I like this. It just says words, he says, are pale shadows of forgotten names. And then he says, as names have power, words have power. Words can light fires in the minds of men, words can wring tears from the hardest hearts. That's true. Like the right words said or the wrong words said 
uh, there's nobody immune to them. And whether we think of words in written or spoken form, we need to meditate on that high priority given to words that we saw in Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. And then meditating on that, the um, really great Bible scholar called John Gill, he's... um, He's from the sort of 18th century and uh, brilliant uh, Bible commentator in many ways. Sometimes he's a little bit over reliant on what he calls rabbinical commentaries, and that's um, it, it's a weakness of his, and and it and it's a, it, it's a, it undermines him sometimes. But overall, his tremendous ability to take Jesus seriously and to handle the bible the way the bible do- handles the bible there are very very few bible scholars throughout all of history who are quite as good as john gill anyway this is what he says when he's meditating on proverbs 18 21 uh, death and life this is quotation from him now death and life are in the power of the tongue uh, of witnesses according to the testimony they bear of judges, according to the sentence they pass, of teachers, according to the doctrine they preach, of all men who, by the well or ill speaking, bring death or life to themselves and others. Some, by their tongues, by the too free use of their tongues, or falsehood they utter, they are the cause of death to themselves and others. And some, by their silence, or by their prudent speech and prevalent intercession, they secure or obtain life for themselves and others. Yes, and judgment at the last day will proceed according to a man's words. As Jesus says in Matthew twelve thirty seven. By your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. So the tongue is the instrument either of a great deal of good or of a great deal of evil. Well, that's John Gill, and there's huge wisdom and truth in what he says there. Um, And then particularly just being aware of of how Jesus says it's uh, by our words in the end we shall be justified And do you think justified, made right before God and by our words will be condemned? Everything, salvation, damnation, depends on our words. So let's go back to language as God's gift. Adam and Eve could talk as soon as they were created. Let that sink in for a moment. It's a it's an easily overlooked feature of the creation of Adam and Eve, but they are not created as um sort of wordless grunt with wordless grunts and that they have to slowly develop language for themselves. No As soon as they are created, Adam and Eve can talk and hear language. They can understand language spoken to them and they can speak it. The Lord God didn't wait for them to invent language. He created them with language already built into them, hardwired into the human system 
is language. We we might have a chance to notice how uh, how how that is understood, even by quite secular researchers about language and human uh, life. Um, that is noticed. It's hardwired into us. So um, Adam and Eve, humanity shared God's ability to speak from the very first day of existence. God, the living God, wanted to talk to them. The Lord God wanted to tell them about the world and himself. This living God wanted human beings to share life with each other by talking, hearing him, speaking to him, talking to one another, listening to one another. All of that is um, built in immediately. So language is God's gift to us, according to the scriptures, to connect him to us, for us to share in the kind of life that is the Trinitarian life of God. And then to connect us to each other. But also this gift of language to us connects us with the world around us. Until we are named, we are cut off from life. When someone speaks our name, then we are recognised and included. And um, so much to say about that, that if we are not named, uh, we, are, we, we are not present and we have no life. That fact of people speaking to us, naming us, is what incorporates us into life. And all of that is built on this fact that we are, uh, we were designed and created to live as church. We were created to live as one body, sharing all of life together, helping one another, encouraging one another, challenging one another, working together to grow more and more into the fullness of God's own life. Language makes all this possible. And when a person is deaf or mute, we create new forms of language to make sure that we can still communicate. We overcome all kinds of obstacles to everyday speech, to include everybody in language. But all of this is built on this idea that language is prior to human existence and prior to even cosmic existence. And that, that's what we will move on to and think about now because that's that's been sitting there the whole time in everything we've said about language we're thinking about the eternal language of the living god so this living god who is this society family of 3 this god used words to set out truth and meaning before the universe began. So um, this, this is important for us to grasp that uh, the living God did not begin to use language simply because of us. As if, for example, we invented language so God accommodates himself to fit in with this language stuff that we've come up with but that God inherently doesn't bother with language. I mean, I've heard people, even people who were quite theologically responsible, 
genuinely believe, genuinely believe that within God there is no language at all. I mean, I remember one theologian. At, um, I was stood outside, just near to Saint Paul's Cathedral in London, and this is going back probably thirty years. Uh, I won't name him because somewhat famous, but he genuinely was saying that within God there is there are not three like uh, separate consciousnesses or minds or whatever, but that there's just this single mind and consciousness that requires no communication, no like the three persons father son and spirit really he was saying when you get down to it they share a single mind so that there's no need for them to communicate with one another speak to one another have any kind of discourse or dialogue with each other and he was really insistent on that and it's i mean i did just gently ask even 30 years ago um could is there any biblical basis for saying that given that the the bible really does seem to repetitively frequently describe intra-trinitarian uh dialogue and conversation so we we have to say that according to the biblical revelation the living God used words to set out truth and meaning before the universe began. And even the, like, let that sink in. Even the very best human writers and speakers have only been using words for really a few years. And, you know, after 20, 30, 40, 50 years of careful use of words and, um, improving our skill at writing and speaking, we can become what we feel reasonably good at using language, quite skillful at using language. But we really, you know, maybe 50 years of, of meaningfully, skillfully using language. But the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, this living God, they have been using language for infinite, eternal ages, endlessly using language and words to speak to one another. So imagine what just, it's, you know, the skill of language use within the Trinity. So before the universe began, the Father was planning and choosing all his purposes. But the Bible asserts that this was all done with his word. And that, in other words, it wasn't done wordlessly, intuitively, sort of, but done with word uh, a logos, a logic, an order. Um, so John 1, 1 to 4, explaining what's going on in Genesis chapter 1, exegeting Genesis 1, if you will, John 1, 1 to 4 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, the word, all things were made. Without this word, nothing was made that has been made. In this word was life, and that life was the light of all humanity. So the word of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the perfect expression of all that the Father is and all his plans. 
And we get that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He is the express image of the Father's person, hypostasis. And he holds the whole creation together by his powerful word. All of that, Hebrews 1, verses uh, 1 to 4, similarly. This idea then that he, this word, is this expression of the Father's person, but that he also holds the, uh, sustains the whole universe by speech, by his word. That the, the word of God sustains, upholds, holds together, unifies the whole universe with his own speech, his own words. So before human beings were made in the image of God, there was the eternal image of God, who is Jesus Christ, and he's described as the word of God who upholds everything by his word. So language was not invented by God to deal with his creation. Within the Trinity, there has always been language. The gift of language to us is right at the heart of us sharing in the divine nature. So to share in the divine nature, it, that is something experiential and overwhelming and beyond our ability to uh, fully describe and so on, sure. But to participate in the divine nature, absolutely essential to that is speech, praise, worship, words, speaking. So Jesus is eternally this expression, verbal expression of God, the Father, the image of uh, but we'll come to the image language in a future one when we look at art more carefully. But here, rather than just the word, the image, like visual art, the visual depiction, he is this word, like a, a spoken expression of the Father. So he is that eternally and he has been eternally listening to his father and praising him. All of that is in the Bible. That's what he does. So the father has eternally been speaking to his son, expressing and delighting in his word. The son has eternally delighted to do his father's will and has eternally praised him for it. Therefore, the basic pattern of how we should relate to God is part of the very life of God in eternity. That to, to participate in the divine nature include it like if within God there has been this obedient listening uh, Faithful speaking, obedient listening, proper praise, all that's been going on within the Trinity for all eternity. Then when we participate in the divine nature, we are we included within that is faithful speaking, obedient listening, true worship. All of that is has been going on within the life of God for all eternity. And so as we learn to speak and listen correctly, we're doing, we're, we, we're, we're, begin, we're participating in the kind of language life that has always existed within the life of God. So the pattern of God relating to God, he speaking, 
God speaking, God listening, using language towards God, all of that is eternally established within the Trinity in the Son's relationship to his Father by the Spirit. So the expression of the Father's design and will in, in, his, in word is an eternal, essential aspect of the life of God. That's just, and that needs to sink in that the idea that, that the Father expresses him, his will, in word, eternally. And that word um, responds to him with praise and worship uh, eternally. All of that is so important. The idea that that uh, it's not as if the living God simply kind of merely feels or intuits or something but eternally speaks and expresses truth. That's hugely important to grasp that. Uh, the pattern of all language is found within the Trinity. Let's put it as simply as that. The pattern of all language is found in God. So um, Jesus is the archetypal word and all human language is ectypal. If I can use slightly technical language there. So in other words, he Jesus is the original word and our language is copied from him. G like within God, we have the archetype the ruling pattern the original kind of language and speech and ours is ectypal like copied out of that patterned after it i'll just say it again jesus is the archetypal word and all human language is um supposed to be designed to be ectypal in other words Language within the Trinity, when we're thinking that and thinking that seriously, we look at Jesus and see that he is the original word, the original language, or the Father speaking to the Son and the Son listening and all of this happening by the breath of God. That's the original of language. And then human language on earth is copied from that, patterned after it. And we want to approximate to the way language is done within the Trinity. 